I'll talk about some of my projects among uh, art and neuroscience uh, more specifically, not so much calls. I'll show you some examples of my works uh, in collaboration with neuroscientists, which is very different to work with neuroscience, <laughs> in order to open my own code as uh, artistic work. Uh, we are connected with uh, information in everyday life, and we believe in our tools for processing and give shape to it. But how do we deal with what has no form? I guess this is the very most uh, question for discovering in art and science. The relationship between what is known and what is unknown. I born in a city in the southern part of Argentina. We had sea, and we had a harbor where I saw people from all over the world during my childhood, the immigrants. The sea and them inspired me because they were part of a mystery. This motivated me to draw imaginary maps full of colors and strange symbols in order to give an answer that I didn't know. Since then, I always felt curiosity for that is unknown and different. Some years ago, I heard a story about Africa, by the way. It told the Ndembu hunters of Zambia leave marks in the trees when they go for hunting. The practice is called Chihikihilu, which literally means lighthouse, and at the same time, to open the way. Around the Dembu village, there exists a circle of marks that separate the known, the ordered world, from the unknown and chaotic. The limit for them represents the present. So they can enter to the jungle always walking path without the now, into the now that is traversing the past. At the age, in the present, they install that lighthouse that illuminates what we do not know yet from where we glimpse the future. This story made me think about many of the projects I'm currently doing at the Conference in Art and Science. It is supposed that art and science explore the limits of unknown. There is, there is where they can, be, they can encounter one each other, where questions can arise and share with others. That's why several of my projects are developed in company of scientists, like Mariano Sigman, an Argentine scientist, neuroscientist, with whom I have been working for 10 years. One of our frequent questions deals with vision, gaze, and brain. For those who make images in art, the gaze is fundamental. It could be said that the gaze is the substance of which the images are constituted. But how do we look at an image? For instance, take a look at this image, please. What do you see in the image? Can you guess which part of the image capture your attention, your eyes? Suppose for a moment, we can access to something very intimate, like the people gaze. Let's suppose for a while, we could see through the eyes of somebody. We can experience it uh, with this kind of devices, eye tracker devices. Those devices are used in laboratories, allowing us to detect how we look at an image we can see uh, where in the image we stop for a while retrieving information, how we move through it, and at the same time, something very, very important. Which part of the image was do not see? We do not see, although we believe having seen it completely. 
if we may look through someone's eyes, we look something like this. Um, it's a very slow motion movement of the eyes of somebody. Look at that image. But what happens if we see with 40 people at the same time this image? We realize that we spy part of the world through our eyes. And the brain builds the rest of it. We see how we build an image in time, something that we are not entirely aware of. In addition, our eyes have a very uh, uh, a, very, a way of moving that is very particular in each of us, in each one of us, as if it were our signature or a ways to speak, a ways of dancing. Now I will show you how we reconstruct the image by means of 450 gestures of cases observing the image simultaneously. Uh, we generate videos with this, and we call this series uh, of works developed by eyes. This is a collective construction of an image. It reveals some unexpected characteristic of it that we couldn't predict beforehand since only one gaze. By means of this project's uh, process and technology, we generate videos and large print formats like this one and this one, another one. Can you detect what is it? Sunflowers, right. <laughs> there are sunflowers. Uh, it's around 350 people looking at them. But what if we apply such a kind of fission cognition processes to faces? We can, ha we can have the very same experiment, but some, something completely different with different implications, mainly if you work with portraits of immigrants and refugees in the world. When we are in front of a face, we formulate a very simple question, who is it? It's the very first question. We look for answers in the very first moment, and where is that information in faces? Maybe in the eyebrows, the eyes, nose, corners, that's true. Hair, borders, some details in face. Researches in social cognitions or social judgments have been developed during last years. In the other hand, portraits and gestures have a long tradition in art. But there is an observation by Alberto Giacometti that captured our attention specially. Giacometti became aware of the nose holes, the corners of the mouth and ear, the skin pores and textures, all together with eyes, constitute that is called the gaze of the image. Giacometti had a very accurate perception of the, of the spectator interaction with the portrait image. So what if we reveal faces according to the moments of the gestures of many gazes, we obtain these kind of things. We have produced a big database of gazes. We have a series of video and generative portraits having, uh, we have so many people looking at other kind of people. <laughs> but in this case, faces are built in a collective creation. And this social construction, construction has to do with our identity given by the gazes of others. We have the, same, the very same methods, but we are saying something completely different now. Uh, next and final example I show you. It is a process inspired my younger daughter, Eva, when she was four or five years old. She could perceive a very interesting concept in reading cognition. Eva was learning to read at the time. She played with me a very simple game called words. I wrote a word, 
and she spelled it slowly, as usual in children. When she finished to reproduce the sound of each character, she recognized the word immediately. And thus, the word was revealed for her for the first time. And when she listened to herself, their eyes got bigger and her face appeared with extreme surprise and happiness. But sometimes, she read the first letters and tried to decipher the possible word beforehand. That is what we call to read, the reading. Nevertheless, Eva named it to guess. To read was to guess for her. And this work has to do with this. This project uh, has to do with the visible and the invisible that constitutes a whole. The invisible transforms the visible into the imagination of a totality. In any case, we have science experiments that become art. Our practice transits through the disciplines as if we were moving through very different territories with their own languages, histories, worldviews, and prejudices. If we forget for a moment the artistic object of art, and we assume that art is a process, one can think that artistic materializations emerge from a particular sequence of material and conceptual arrangements, a sort of logical, illogical, rational, and irrational code. We used to approach knowledge in science as well as a piece of finished work. Nevertheless, a formula, a theory, an experiment has nothing to do with the very process of discovery. Art and science are everyday practices full of blurred procedures. Artistic processes could be totally embedded in scientific methodologies and vice versa, this is something that can have different serendipities even 
despite art and science. The searching for those contexts of luring borders needs the essential role of other ones. Borders are something to be practiced, oversteeped, not so much theorized. Given time for dialoguing where we share the openness of the unknown, experiencing the multilingual aspect of the world. It implies, in any case, to constitute a context of human and technical resources in collaboration. I imagine that the creativity of the future will have to do with this type of transdisciplinarity and transcultural collaboration processes. Today we say that we are in front of creative practices more and more established and developed among different groups that share what they do not know. The searching for novelty is not just for cause. Novelty could be in between us, as always. And coming back to Dembus, this is my C. We can move through the past through what we know. We can reach the age of our knowledge and perceptions in the present. There will eventually appear other ones who also seek the unknown. We might be part of their chaos, probably. But knowing that with them, there is also our future. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Mariana. Are there any questions? Uh, with regard to your eye, eye movement, your recording, is the difference between man and woman? Oh, yeah. There, there are <laughs> I'm not very technician on that stuff, but yeah, it's supposed to be different ways to recognize an, uh, an image, so it depends on the subject you are looking at. But there are some researches about that, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for your lovely uh, talk. And on, in that same vein, uh, regarding the, the artworks with the books, the oh, reading yeah. in the invisible, how did people respond to actually being able or not able to read the text through other people's eyes, so to speak? I'm curious oh, what kind yeah, of responses that's, that's, came. That's the main topic of a piece, actually, because it's a way to infer the world through the eyes of other. So, at the end, everything is the same. You have just partiality of the world, and it's just become aware of that. It's, and it's funny, because you try to decipher what is, if you take the, the, the read part, okay, you can infer something, and the other in the other one, and you can take a lot of time trying to define what I'm talking about. But that's a, all the very experience of trying to recognize something in the world. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on, on the eye tracker you had uh, points and lines uh, but you don't represent somehow our uh, like uh, uh, the center is very very different center perception is very different center, different in the eyes while there's a peripheral perception of uh, gestalt uh, even outside of the center so it's oh yeah yeah, uh, yeah, yeah in did the you focus. think about yeah. Did you think about a way how to include that aspect? Well, <laughs> that would be fantastic. That's a, a long-term research. That's the very point of the question. I mean, because we, we know we can gather information if you maybe, when you look at the, the, those lines, they are seconds. And maybe you spend a time between two fixation points. If you have a statistic of all those decades, you have a distribution. But the, the longest time between fixation, it implies a cognition process. But we don't know what they're talking about in that cognition process. That's, that's, it would be fantastic to have an, inf an idea of what is happening there. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, at the same time, it's, uh, it reveals some characteristic of the image and the interaction with your gaze. Uh, but it's, that is all the thing that we can do. So. <laughs> we know so we not so much about, not so much about it. <laughs> Funny. Uh. 
Um, well, maybe um, it's not that related to your topic, but it came to your it came to my mind um, uh, while you were talking that uh, Hans Belting in uh, Florence and Baghdad, uh, he was uh, uh, he was talking about gays, but uh, but about the gays of the perspective, so the perspective and uh, uh, the scientific approach to perspective and uh, and rather um, um, or so on the other other hand the perceptional um, approach to it um, do you plan to uh, go in this direction to um, to take the work into to another level or uh, with um, uh, depicting so like a to go in the direction of depiction, or uh, you rather concentrate uh, on uh, on the gaze itself? <laughs> I really don't know what's next step uh, because, yeah, it's uh, some sort. Of, I, I mentioned that some of your my own call is much more randomly, uh, but I don't know. Maybe yeah, uh, the gaze is something that is very Im important, at least for me. Um, I guess uh, it's interesting. We are uh, involved in some researches in reading in the uh, Eastern cultures, Chinese and Japanese, which is very different in, 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 in completely different. Uh, the variables uh, you can have is such much more tiny uh, movement in the fixation moment because they had to select from pa some part of a character. So, uh, and at the same time. We have a very good, uh, well, um, uh, we, we learn to read in uh, expecting what is happening in this direction, because we read from here to here, from here to here. And they read it in the opposite way. So they, expect, they have some much uh, sensitive in this direction. And that is it's very interesting because for us, the world has a specific point for in which we gather information. But for them, according to some neuroscientists in China, um, it's interesting because they try to decipher what, which is the least cycle around your specific fixation point with your eyes, in which you gather the most information possible. And because of the character, because of the Chinese character, or even the Japanese. So this kind of researches are very interesting for us. But, you know, <laughs> who knows <laughs> what is going to happen? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay, so as I see, there are no more questions. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.